right, good morning. Good morning. I should have said that nicer, huh? <laughs> good morning. Good morning. Um, welcome. To those of you that are here in Phoenix, for those of you that are watching us online, apps, Roku, or YouTube, glad you're with us. If you want to know more about our ministry, go online to womensbiblestudy.com. There you can get handouts for today's lesson, catch up on our big series that we're doing, um, and uh, I think that's all I need to tell you. Is that right? Okay. Um, we are in the series on the book of Revelation, and I want to start actually with a map. Now, the reason why we have all of these lampstands up here is because there was a scene in Revelation at the very beginning where Jesus walked through these lampstands, and each one of these lampstands were an actual literal church in Turkey at this particular time. Here is a map up here of this area that is modern-day Turkey. Uh, Patmos out there on the left hand to the bottom is a little island. This is where the Apostle John has been banished for his faith and, and, and sharing Jesus with other people. Uh, it's been 60 years now since... Um, Jesus died on a cross, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven. The church, the early church has started. It's been 60 years, and, and out of all seven, there's six right here. The seventh will be next week. Um, out of all seven churches, five of them were a complete disaster. Two of them, Jesus had great commendations for, and that is what is going to be today. Uh, Jesus comes along and tells people, he, this is his reason, he wants us to, to know what to watch out for while we're living on the earth, in between when Jesus rose from the dead and when he comes back. Because you and I are in this in-between stage of, of, of those two events, and Jesus comes to, this, to John on the island of Patmos and says, I need you to send a letter to these seven churches, there's six up here, like I said, um, and, and tell them what they're doing wrong and what they're doing right, and that's why... Um, um, that's why this particular point. So let's start here. Uh, the first week was Ephesus. Uh, their problem was that they lost their first love. They were very busy, but, but they just didn't, uh, they lost their love for Jesus. Smyrna was the second church. They were, they're the suffering church. God, Jesus had nothing but great things to say for them. Uh, we have Pergamum. They were the compromising church. Um, we had Thyatira, the tolerant church. And last week was Sardis, the church of the walking dead. I think sometimes it, it frustrates me to do these two series back-to-back -back with Acts and this because I feel like sometimes all we do is just talk negative. You need to stop compromising. You need to stop tolerating. You need to do this and you need to do that. And it's just so overwhelming. And sometimes I'm just like, it's just sometimes too much for me. So today is a, a welcome break because today we're going to talk about the Church of Philadelphia and they are the faithful church. Now, I'm hoping today to encourage you, to encourage a lot of you who, who do a lot for Jesus, and you love him, and you serve him, and, and nobody really notices, and nobody commends you, and today I'm hoping that you feel very loved and, and commended for, the, for what you've, what you, the life that you live. So this week we're talking about Philadelphia. Now the problem with this little church in Philadelphia was that it was actually situated on a fault line where there was always earthquakes. So there'd be an earthquake, then they'd have to rebuild, and there would be an earthquake, and then you'd have to rebuild. And I'm not like the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I think moving might have been probably the best idea if you lived in Philadelphia. <laughs> but last week, John writes this letter to, this, to, to um, the church in Sardis, and he has nothing, where is Sardis, wherever it is, he had nothing good to say about Sardis at all. It was bad Sardis, you're pathetic, you've done everything wrong. Um, but this week, we're at the church of Philadelphia, and he has nothing bad to say at all about this church. All he has is just good things. I love you. You guys are doing a great job. And I thought Smyrna was the only church that um, actually Jesus commended, but Philadelphia was also. And he has lots of applause and encouragement for them. So let's open this up here, Revelation 3, 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these things says he who is holy and he was true. Jesus always opens up these letters with something that's going on. And apparently in this particular letter, he wants people to know um, that not only he is holy and true, but he sees this little church living a holy life filled with truth. I, I guess I just want to say this, that I think a lot of times we've misunderstood the fact that following Jesus means this, that this is our job, to be, have a holy life filled with truth. And this church is going to remind us of this. What does the word holy mean? It means this. It means set apart. I, I, I saw this um, at church the other day. Our pastor set, got up and said, 
I meet with 10 to 12 guys. And he said, we just started meeting, hanging out. None of them are Christians. And he said, they don't even know I'm a pastor. And he said, I think I can do this for a couple more weeks before they really catch on that I am a pastor. But he said, I hear the worst conversations, the worst language, the worst everything. And the point is, is that our pastor can be in a group like that and be just like this, set apart, be different. He doesn't go along with them. He doesn't join into their conversations. He says, I want this group of guys to know that I'm going to be there for them. But he said, so I can't be, be set apart like, oh, I live in my little bubble and I never go out of my house because I don't want to be tainted by the world. That's not what any of this means. This just means we're different. I was thinking about this. We were talking, Betty, about you the other day, and I don't, I don't remember who was talking, but we were talking about how awesome you are, okay? So we just, we love you, but, but if, if you came to me, um, and knowing Betty, and, and said, hey, is Betty a Christian? My answer would be like, uh, absolutely. Like, she prays, she helps people, she's kind, she doesn't gossip. If she works somewhere, I'm sure she'd be the best employee, but if Betty wasn't the way she was, let's just say, and she says she's a Christian, but, and you didn't really know her, and you, I walked up and said, um, hey, is Betty a Christian to you? And you sort of know her. She, you'd be like, well, I don't know. She doesn't act any different than anyone else. I, I don't know if she's a Christian or not. Nothing, nothing's going on that I know of. Or would they say, are you crazy? Like Betty? She goes to bar with me every night. Like, she goes to the bar, and she hangs out, and she gets drunk before she goes home to her husband. Like, she's the worst employee at all. Like, could you imagine that? But my point is, is that how do people look at you and me? Are you, they, are you in one of the, like, if they, if they know you, do they say, oh, no, she's different. She's a Christian by how she acts. Not weird Christian, not weird religious, not, you know, because Christians can be the weirdest people. We do know that. They can act so strange and odd, and, and that's not what we're talking about. We're saying you're set apart. You're just different but you're different in a good way. You're different because you're loving and kind and compassionate, and, and that's how you are. So what the question is, ask ourselves this, am I living a wholly separate, distinct, set-apart life? The question is, how do we do this? Here's what. Putting a Jesus fence around us. I act like that animal a lot. <laughs> and so that's why I put him up there, because I'm like, yeah, that looks like me sometimes. Um, but what we need to do is find out what being a follower of Jesus and then put a fence. Now, last class was a disaster. Every, everything went, fell apart. So if I fall off the stage, here's the deal. This is what I'm thinking. Ah, okay. Here's my fence around me. That's what it needs to look like. What does it look like to be a Christian and then to keep all the stuff that's bad out from coming into me? That's what being holy is. It's not saying I'm better than anyone. It's just a protection. It's protecting us from, from doing things that we shouldn't do at all. A fence does this. It will keep anything that I'm not supposed to be doing or looking at outside the fence. And I think that's what being holy is. It's saying, look, I need to be this way. I need to be a light. And the only way I'm going to do that is to, to have a fence. I call a Jesus fence around me. Larry Booker tells a story about um, um, he pastored a church that was 600 people, but he said none of them were living holy lives. So someone asked him to come and preach on holiness. So he, he goes there and he explains to everyone that he bought um, a big piece of property in the country because he wanted to raise sheep. So he got a, a herd of sheep and he decided to take some fence and he fenced the sheep in and, of course, put shade and water and all that kind of stuff. He said, but then he came back out a couple days later, and the sheep had broken through the fence and were just grazing outside the fence. And he said, well, that's ridiculous. Maybe they need a bigger size. So he enlarged the fence to make them happy. Three days later, he came out, and they had broken through the fence and were outside the fence. Well, it made him so mad. He said, this is ridiculous. What's wrong with these stupid sheep? And so he said, I'm just taking the fence down. He said, fine. They have the whole field. Do whatever you want to do. I'm just not even going to worry about it. Early the next morning, he got a phone call from a farmer, and he said, Pastor, you need to get down here. He said, you've got a mess on your hands. Wild dogs came in last night and literally killed every one of your sheep because he didn't have a fence up. When the pastor arrived, he saw, said that the sheep were dead, and, and the dogs didn't even, like, eat the sheep. They just killed them out of this killing frenzy. But he says, I stood there looking at this whole gruesome scene. He said... The Lord just kind of spoke to his heart this way and said this. Fences are not just to keep things in, they're also to keep some things out. 
And that's what this little church in Philadelphia, they wanted anything in their life that would hurt them or hurt their witness for Jesus, they put a fence around them so that none of that would infiltrate their life, infect their life, so that they would be, if they wanted to share Jesus, people wouldn't laugh at them like, why would I ever like follow Jesus? Look at your life. Do you see what I'm saying? The church in Philadelphia was like this. They put fences up like, I'm not going to watch porn. I'm not going to go to that party because I know if I do, I know exactly what's going to happen. I'm not going to hang out with those friends. Not because I think I'm better than them, but I know if I do, I'm going to follow this track and I'm going to be a disaster by midnight tonight. I'm not going to, and you fill in whatever blank you want to. So today I want to talk a little bit about holiness. We're going to watch a video. But here's what D.L. Moody said. He said, a life... Um, a holy life will make the deepest impression. Lighthouses blow no horns, they just shine. Chuck Swindoll says this. He says, holiness sounds crazy, scary. It doesn't need to be, but to the average American it is. Our tendency is to say that holiness is something for the cloistered halls of a monastery. Think about it. If you think about that, that word, holiness, you think, oh, that's just something for like the monks, it's just being holy. And that's how we think of holiness. He said it needs organ music, long prayers, a religious-sounding chants. It hardly seems appropriate for those in the real world of this century. What words come to mind when you think of holiness? It's almost as though holiness is the private way of life for a special group of monks, missionaries, and martyrs, but nothing could be further from the truth. Joe Scrandit says this, As long as our notions of holiness are limited to doing certain things and not doing other things, we can go through our entire lives obeying the rules or at least maintaining the appearance of doing so without dealing with far more fundamental questions like, whose are we and to whom do we give our first love and loyalty? I thought this was great. To be holy means that all we are and all we have belongs to God not ourselves, and that every aspect of our lives is to be shaped and directed towards God. See, that's a little bit different than what you and I think of holiness, but really holiness is this. God, here's my life. I want everything I do to be directed towards you, not to just me and what I want. And when you start doing that, you you start going on this holiness road. How does this play out in our life? Ephesians 1.4 says this. First, you got to know this. We are God's own chosen ones, his own picked representatives. I would say that's a life-changing thought if you really realize that. He picked me. I don't understand why. I'm a spoiled, rotten, bratty sinner. We do know that. But somehow in his grace and mercy, he chose me to represent him. And if you are a Christian, here's the deal for you. He picked you to represent him. And that's the first part of holiness, recognizing that. And and Paul doesn't stop there when he says that he chose you. Here's what you and I need to know. We have a responsibility to be holy. And sometimes I think we forget this aspect of following Christ. So here's our question. What does the Bible say a person who is holy looks like? We'll read this in Colossians 3. Therefore, as God's chosen people, remember, God chose you to represent him, dearly love people, sorry. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy, there's our word, dearly loved, clothe yourself. This is what holy people should look like. With compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with one another. Forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. So as we look at this little church in Philadelphia, they have these traits. And so the question that we need to ask ourselves today is, how do I get that? How do I get to that point where I live a holy life? And it starts with this, looking within ourselves, opening up the Bible, and saying, God, change me. For the the next 17 minutes, we're going to watch a video. It's a big part of our lesson today. But for those of you that have um, been with us before and watched the skit, guys, I bought this uh, video from Sermon Spice. But they're funny, and they make me laugh, and they're just, they, you know, but they, they always come up with a really great point. And if we want to be like the church in Philadelphia, I thought today that this would help us see exactly how to do that. So we'll watch this, and we'll come back and talk about it. We wanted just to um, give you some scripture to help you out with that. It's one of our favorite verses, and uh, it's in Psalm 139, and uh, it's verse 23 and 24. And for us, this, this verse just really means a lot because you can make this a prayer. Um, and it says this, it says, 
Search me, O God, and know my heart, test my thoughts, point out anything in me that you find sad, and lead me along the path of everlasting life. I mean, that's a really great, that's a great prayer right there. Yeah, it's a very introspective passage that you can make into a prayer. So let's just kind of show them what it would be like to turn that into a prayer. So they can work it out, just work it out right now. Yeah. As a skit. Yeah. Okay. Go for it. All right. Okay. She said, woo. I didn't know if it was. I thought there was a spider monkey out there. I didn't know what that was. All right. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Um, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Search me, O God. What? What? Tommy? Tommy? You you look a little constipated. What's going on? What's, What's going on? I am not Tommy. You are, you're not Tommy, who are you? Nay. Are, are, you, are you a horse? What, nay. nay. No. What, what, what? I'm God. You, oh, you're God. Yay. Oh, search me, oh God. Yeah, you're, that's why God says yay uh, and nay. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, 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 what are you, okay, I'll go with it. What, what, what are you, okay, you, what, what are you doing, what are you doing now, God? I am smiting people. Oh. You're, you're, you're smiting people? Yeah, smite. You know, smite. <laughs> you know, smite. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Finished? Yeah. Yeah? Hmm. All right. Did you get him? No, I spared him. You spared him? Yes. I wouldn't have. Okay. No, 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 come back, come back, come back, come back. Just, oh, okay. But you know what? We have, we have skits where, you know, one of us plays God, you know, like God's chisel, that kind of stuff. Okay, so, I'll, yeah. be, I'll be Jesus. Well, we got skits like that, too. Okay, well. That's the two parts of the Trinity, so I don't know what you want me to do. There's, there's three parts of the Trinity. I don't think so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 you know. Well, God and Jesus, that's no, it. No, no, yo. God in three persons, blessed, blessed Trinity. Trinity. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I thought that was the three people singing it. No, no, that's, <laughs> no, that's, that's a, that's, that's a trio. That's oh. a trio. Oh, so yeah. the Trinity is like a trio of God. Yeah, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. I'll be the Holy Ghost, yeah. all right? I'm okay. like Casper. I'm friendly, but I'm holy, all right? Yeah. <laughs> you can just call me HG, all right? Uh-huh. Okay. I'll, I'll call you God, but it'll be implied that you're the Holy Spirit. You are that still, small voice. That's what that is. <laughs> I thought I was alien. No. <laughs> Feels so much better. <laughs> okay. All right. So... All right, so we'll just keep, okay. Search me, oh God. All righty. Whoa, 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 no, you are not. Yep, no. You just relax. I can't. All right, I can't relax. relax. No. A lot easier if you'll relax. I can't let go. Me, no, let me just get you to move right over here. Well, all right. Just, here we go. Just take a seat. Here ah! we go. Ah! What are you doing? I thought you were. No. No, I don't like to get fingerprints on this. Oh. Okay. What did you think I was I, doing? I, I, So what, 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 what is this? Uh, this is your heart right here. See that? Uh-huh. That's your heart. Uh-huh. And, um, well, your heart has muck and guck on it. My heart has muck and guck. Yeah. Muck and guck. I, I mean, that's what I see right there. I see muck, guck, and, oh, there's some yuck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> your heart has muck, guck, and yuck, like a lifetime of, of bad choices covered with muck, guck, and yuck. Muck, guck, and yuck. Seriously, that's what the Holy Spirit's going to say. Muck, guck, yuck. Seriously, muck, guck, yuck. Okay. You want serious? Sure. I'll give you serious. Your heart is the wellspring of life. You should guard it with all that you are because there is a great battle going on for the allegiance of your heart. And most times you're doing lukewarm at best. Um, search me, O oh God, and know my heart, test my thoughts. There you go. 
What are these? Those are your thoughts. These are my thoughts? Yeah. Not my thoughts. Yeah, they no are. Way they're about th these are my thoughts. Wow, wow. How did you get a hold of my thoughts? Hello. Right. Okay. All right. Okay. okay. This is something for me to peruse a little bit later, and I will do that. Okay. This, 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 let's just go through them right now. Go through my thoughts? Yeah. I, I don't want, no, no, not, not in front of all these people. I don't want to go through my thoughts in front of these people. Why not? Well, I mean, they're going to think what I think if they're thinking about my thoughts, and those are my thoughts that I'm thinking. If they're thinking my thoughts, I'm thinking, wow, those are my thoughts that they're thinking. That's a lot of thoughts to be thinking, you think? Fortunately, I'm the Holy Spirit, so I understand those dronings. <laughs> Look, let's just uh, start at the f top. We'll just go through. Just trust me, okay? Mm -hmm. It's not bad. Um, it, starting at the beginning, in the, in the A's, you have some anger issues. I don't have anger issues. You, you really I, do. I don't. No. Yeah, I don't I mean, have anger issues. Well, I mean, your parents would say okay, that. Okay, no. My parents come from a different generation. They don't get the world that we live in now, okay? So it's not anger, okay? It's appropriate frustration, but it's not anger, all right? Okay, all right, okay. Okay, 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 fine. okay, okay, okay. Yeah, okay, okay. Um, how about uh, your friends? Your okay. friends say... Okay. My friends, my friends, I am the leader of my friends, and they come to me for advice, all right? And I give them advice, but they do not take my advice, and it makes me, it makes me a little angry, okay? It, it, it gives me this. Do you see that? Do you see that? It, 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 it gives me that, okay? But, but I am the leader, and they don't listen. Do you know what it's like to be a leader of a lot of people, and they do not listen? Have you ever read the Bible? <laughs> I'm just saying, okay, I'm just saying that, that I, I think my anger is in check, and sometimes that anger can be very, very healthy in a lot of different ways, okay? It's an emotion, all okay, right? Okay, okay, but the people that drive on the road with they're you... They're morons! They're complete idiots! <laughs> they are morons! They should all go to... An island, a secluded island where there are no cars and far, far away from me. Wow, no anger problems here. Okay, all right. I, I, have, I have a hang up and I will work on this, all right? I will work on it, okay? But it's, it's, it's I, mean, but, well, I mean, does it really matter what I think? Oh, yeah. As you think, as you think in your heart, that's who you are. Listen, you sow a thought you reap an action. You sow an action, you reap a habit. You sow a habit, you reap a lifestyle. And it all begins with your thoughts. But here's the deal. I can't erase everything in this book. I mean, it's my uh, past. I'm not asking you to erase it. I'm asking you to trust me with the story that I'm weaving through your life. It's called history for a reason. History. His story. Exactly. Okay, well, that's good, though. Search me, O oh God, know my heart, test my thoughts. That's a lot, right? It's a great place to start, but I'd, I'd like to go deeper. Do we have to? We don't. We don't have to go deeper, and to be honest with you, most of my children don't even make it to this point. But I have great plans for you, and I don't want you to miss out on anything, so I hope you'll trust me. Okay. Um, search me, O oh God, know my heart, test my thoughts, see if there's anything in me that makes you sad. What could I possibly do that would make you that sad? What you doing? I couldn't sleep, so I'm just, you know, I'm on the computer. Mm. What's her name? I don't know her name. I mean, it's just, you know, just a she, you know. Well, it's obvious she's a she. Hey, um, um, <laughs> hey, um, th th uh, that, that was that, um, that, okay, um, she's... Your creation, I was just admiring your creation. You ever thought about looking at trees? <laughs> you, you, you made those too. Yeah. Yeah, I'll look into that one. She? Yeah. You don't even know her name. I know her name, and I know everything about her. And I know the plans I have for her, and this is not a part of it. And this, looking at women in a degrading way, this makes me sad. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, I, I, I have a habit. I have a habit. Great, all right. admitting it is the first step. Okay, and, I, and I'm sorry about this. I really, really am sorry. And you're forgiven. I'm sorry. No, I, did, I didn't mean for this to happen. I heard I'm, you're I'm, sorry, I'm, and you're forgiven. Well, I'm sorry. Okay, you know what? You need to quit that. What? Well, you say I'm sorry all the time. Well, I'm sorry that I'm sorry. <laughs> Stop it. Okay, listen. You've been forgiven. Receive my forgiveness. When you don't receive my forgiveness, you cheapen my grace. And this whole I'm sorry all the time, it, it makes me sad. <laughs> yeah, but I... I, I but what? N nothing. No, say it. No, there, I wasn't going to say anything. Yes, no. you were. No, I was not. Yes, you no, were. And not. now you're lying to me. And when you lie to the Holy Spirit, that makes okay. me sad. Well, I, I, just, I, just say it. No, I wasn't. Say it. There's nothing to say. I dare you. Can the Holy Spirit dare? Just did. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 I wasn't going to say nothing. Yeah, you were. You were going to blame me. I wasn't going to blame you. Yes, you no. were. Yes, no, you were. What? And listen, you blame me. You blame me. It's crazy because great things happen in your life, I get no credit. Something bad happens, boom, it's my fault. You blame me for things, and it's not me. I didn't do it. And when you blame me, that makes me sad. Okay, you're right. But I mean, okay, but look, look at me. I mean, me, okay? I mean, me isn't a lot, okay? And when I try to go out there and walk this walk of faith, and I look at other people, I mean, look, Ray. Okay, Ray is a great example. Ray, I mean, Ray. Ray, Ray has it all together. He's a great leader. I mean, he's a good Christian. He's a good guy. He runs the race. Yeah. I mean, I mean, when he talks, people listen to him. Have you seen his Christmas card of his family? No, I have it on my refrigerator. See what I'm saying? I mean, that's. I mean, Ray. I, he just has it all together. Everybody loves Raymond, you know. And and when I look at his life, and if I could just be a little bit more like Ray, if you could be more like Ray, you know who you'd be? Who? Ray, I want you to try to be like me. This comparison thing, that makes me sad. Well, isn't, isn't that just it though? I mean, let's just be honest. If we're gonna be honest and real, you're just tolerating me. What? Over my past, over my hurts, my habits, my hangups, all the things that I've done, you're just tolerating oh, me. Oh, listen, and, and, and catch this. Jesus Christ didn't die on the cross so that I could tolerate you. He died so that this relationship could be repaired. And when I look at you, I see his perfection, not your hang-ups. I'm, I'm just worried with my life that I'm going to fail you. Uh, you worry so much. <laughs> I was worried you are going to say that. Listen, when you worry, you're not trusting me. I, I trust you. No, worrying is showing you that I really, 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 really care. No, worry is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, and it doesn't take you anywhere. That, that is good. Do you mind if I tweet that? Not right now. I'm really worried that I'm going to forget that. Okay, all right. Um... Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Test me and know, know my anxious thoughts. See if there's anything in me that makes you sad and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Lead, that's an action word, lead. Okay, so if I do more, if I get involved when I go back home, if I do more things for your kingdom, then I will see your, your, your I will honor you and I will see... What, what, are you, what, what, are you, what are you trying to do? What are you doing? What are you doing? I'm trying to get you on your knees. <laughs> well, it's not working. Nope. This is all you. Oh, you want me to pray? Yeah. I don't, I'll pray. I don't, that's cool. All right. Okay. All right. A little more. <laughs> Seriously? Seriously. Okay. That's cute. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But see, I think this is really a good emergent prayer stance, okay? Because there's so many things to do, all right? If my phone, if my phone rings, I'm there. If a text happens, I'm there. I can pray, but I'm there. I'm always ready to go. I'm always ready to go. I'm right? always ready to do what I need to do. You know what I'm saying? I didn't create you to be a human doing. 
I created you to be a human being. To, I just want you to be, to be still and know that I'm God. Then make this your prayer. Oh, why don't you just put me on my knees? I can, but I don't want to, and you certainly don't want me to. Now, make the verse your prayer. Search me, O oh God. Know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. Create in me a pure heart. Clean up my thoughts. I want to live for you. Show me those things that make you sad and let me just go a 180 away from them and live the abundant life that you have for me. And lead me in the way of everlasting life. Amen. There is a God who sent his son to die on a cross so that you could have a relationship with him. And the greatest relationships are the ones where people talk to each other. And he longs for you to spend time talking to him like that and listening to him like that so that he can be your God and that you can be everything he created you to be. Talk to him. Thank you. Yay. Okay. Now, I did that for a reason. I love those guys. They're, they make me laugh. I don't know why. Here's what my point to this whole thing is. To be the Church of Philadelphia, it's going to take doing that. Like getting on your knees and praying, God, what is it that's in me that needs to be changing? Um, that's what holiness, it, it, that's where it starts. It starts with checking what's going on inside of my life, not in someone else's. Um, I told you that we're, we're in the process of moving, and last weekend was a big kind of moving time. And, and most of the weekend, I found myself very annoyed with my husband because he wants to move things different than I do, and it just kind of was like that. And by Monday morning, I woke up, and I just had to stop and say, God, here's the deal. Is it really him, or is it really me? And that was my prayer. If it's me, God, you need to show me and change me. And I think that's the first step in anything, that that should be our heart. Like the Church of Philadelphia saying, God, I just want, I want to be different. I want to be set apart. I want to be a light to others. I don't want to constantly be that person's fault and that person's fault. It's, how about me? God, let's start with me. Revelation 3.7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. Here's my point to this. Jesus says he's the one, he has the key, and he's the one who opens and shuts doors. And I, I know just from the video we, and just what we teach around here that, that Jesus has the keys to salvation. You give your life to Jesus. When it comes time and you die, he opens the door, he puts the key, and he opens it, and he lets you in heaven. So he has those keys. He's the only one that has those keys. But I want to hopefully give you some comfort today to know that it's not just about salvation and eternity. It's about how you live your life today. It's like when our kids were like, who am I going to marry? Who am I going to marry? We're just like, you know what? When God is ready, he's going to take that key, open a door, and let someone walk through that door. It's like the job. Some of you need a job right now. At the right time, God's going to take that key, open the door, and bring a job along. I always know this with my house. We need to sell our house. I told you this. By, by March, it needs to be sold. And, but I know that right now my house literally looks like a bomb went off in it, so it, I, and nobody's looking at it at this point, which I'm so, so happy. But my prayer is, God, you know, and it's comforting to know that when someone's ready to purchase our house, that God's going to put the key in, open the door, and bring someone along. See, there's something about just knowing that God is that in control of everything that should give us a lot of peace. Here's our problem when we know that is God always seems to take his time. 
And we don't like this aspect of God. It frustrates us. But I want you to know as a follower of Christ, there's always going to be that tension that I want something now, but God says, you know what? That's not what my, how my economy works. It doesn't work that way. This se section reminds us this, that he holds the keys and he will open and shut the door when he's ready. He wants us to know that he's in control. He has all the authority. And when we realize we don't have control, it really honestly does lead to a more peaceful life. So for this little church in Philadelphia, Jesus wants them to know, look, I have control of the keys. I know what's going on. And I think for this little church that was on this fault line, that constantly the ground was shaking, Jesus needed to remind them that, that even that can't sway what's going on, that he's even in control of earthquakes and tremors. Verse 8, he says, I know your, the, your record of works and what you're doing. See, I've set before you a door wide open, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and guarded my message and have not renounced or denied my name. This should be an encouragement today for those of you who work really hard. You help others. You minister to people. And, and God has given you this great favor and he's opened up doors for you. But, but here's what you need to know. He sees in your life that you have little power. You may not have money to do your ministry. You may not have, you know, be involved with a large church who will take on your ministry for you. You have no clout around you. You're writing a book, but you don't know a famous author that can do the, you know, the preface to your book. And Jesus commended them and commends you, saying this, God can take what little you offer and turn it into something awesome. I always tell you about this ministry here. When it started, it was three girls. And, and we eventually met at, a, at a, a food court at Arrowhead Mall. I had l something little, and that was a desire to teach the Bible. That's it. I had nothing else. We had no money. We had no copy machine. We had no lights or cameras. Nothing. Just a little teeny tiny desire. We ended up moving into Babos. Most of you know the story. Someone came up to me uh, a year or so into it, handed me an envelope, and in it was $1,000 that said, this is for your ministry. And I always say this, it never even occurred to me that we had a ministry. What I knew is that I would teach, and I didn't even know how to do that, and people would come, and they'd be like, well, she's boring, and then they would leave, and then eventually I would walk in, and no one would be there, and I'd be like, okay, it's over. All right, that, that was how I thought this was going. But God took what little I had, which was this little tiny desire to teach people the Bible, to get the truth of what the Bible says, and, and for people to know Jesus, and God gave us this. And he took something little, because that's what he says. He can take what we just offer, what we have little, and he can do something great with that. Austin Stone Community Church uh, tells a story of, of Jesse. I don't know what I put up here on the screen. Jesse decided to buy a house. He wanted his future home to be a place that God would use to further his kingdom. Though Jesse was only 24 years old and didn't have much money, that's little power. So I want you to think about it. What, what is it in your life that you have little power? You don't have much, but only God can take that and grow it into something bigger. He said, but God made it happen. So Jesse and Rachel were married, but this was their heart. He made it very clear to me he didn't want to give us this house so I could just have a nice place to live, but that this house was a gift from God to lead, um, to be used as a tool for ministry. So they began to open their home each week for missional community gatherings. During that time, their group would sing worship songs, pray for each other, discuss the sermon, and go through a devotional together. However, they still felt confident and broken over the, conflicted, I'm sorry, and broken over the lost people in their lives. So Jesse and Rachel's missional community group took action, incorporating a third place into their weekly meetings in an effort to engage their friends who may not know Jesus. Their third place was a neutral, safe, fun environment where they simply hung out, played games, and got to know each other. Usually held at Jesse's home, they invited their lost friends, neighbors, and co-workers. And many people have walked through the doors of Jesse and Rachel's home and experienced a biblical community that reflects Christ's love. As God continued to bring more people through the doors of their home, Rachel, Jesse, and the rest of their group have started a Bible study that helps equip them to share God's word with their new friends they are connecting with at their third place. Here's what he said. It's exciting when you are able to give in that way. It wouldn't be fun at all if we just lived in this house and used it only for ourselves. I think this is a perfect picture of this church in Philadelphia. Jesse and Rachel didn't have much money, but you know what? God provided them a home, and what little that they had, they opened it up so that they could bless other people. I think that, I don't think I put this verse up here. No. 
in the end of that verse that we just read, it says this, you have kept my word and guarded my message and have not renounced or denied my name. That's what I think God blesses is when people do that, when they guard his message, they keep it, they don't renounce him or deny his name. And I think God then takes what little we have and blows that up. Jesus says this to the church and to us, when you take a stand for Christ and you never deny him, here's what you need to know, nothing you are doing for him ever goes unnoticed. So often we forget to tell people like you, good job. Good job for raising your kids to know Jesus. Good job for being a great grandparent that, that pours your life into kids. Good job for, for making the hard decisions, walking away from that relationship because they don't love Jesus. Like, good job for that. Good job for standing up at your workplace and, 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 and being a light to your husband and your children. Like, sometimes we forget to tell you, good job. And I think this letter to the church in Philadelphia really wants people to know, or he really wants you to know that God really does commend everything that you're doing. Jesus was so proud of them. Some of you feed the homeless. Some of you work at nursing homes. Some of you give money. And, and some of you pay APS bills for people who can't afford it. Or some people pay someone's school because they can't afford it. And nobody knows but you and God. Here's what you need to know. Good job. Jesus sees, and this letter is his commendation to you. I really want you to know that today. Revelation 3.9 says this, Take note, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they're Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet and learn and acknowledge that I have loved you. We see the synagogue of Satan. We saw it back in the church of Smyrna. These are people who claimed to know God because they were physical descendants of Abraham, but they were persecuting this little church. But Jesus says in that verse, don't worry, eventually they're going to acknowledge me. In other words, I want to translate that into your life, the people that make fun of you for your faith, the people that taunt you, the people that laugh at you and say sarcastic things about you. Jesus says, don't worry, I will take care of them. You just keep doing what you're doing. Verse 10 says this, uh, Because you have guarded and kept my word of patient endurance, you've held fast the lesson of my patience with the expectant endurance that I give you. I also will keep you safe from the hour of trial, testing, which is coming on the whole earth to try those who dwell upon the earth. Now, for those of you that know that verse, you know where I'm heading with this. If you were raised believing that there's going to be a rapture, most likely your pastor or someone has read that particular verse to you. And this is my hope that you get this today. You cannot take a verse in the middle of a church to Philadelphia where Jesus is commending these people and, and knowing this, that somewhere along the line, this, this little church in Philadelphia is going to go through a trial or a testing. And it says to those who dwell upon the earth, the known earth at that time, that it was the Roman Empire that was, that was, that was ruling. And what Jesus is saying to this church in Philadelphia, he's not telling us thousands of years later that we're going to be raptured out because of that verse. And I want you to see this in, in spades today, that, this is, that when you take um, a verses in context, you cannot take a verse, yank verse 10 out of there and say, oh, that means we're going to be raptured. It has nothing to do with it. Nothing whatsoever. Jesus is commending this church and saying this, I'm going to keep you, I'm to, keep, to keep you means I'm going to keep you believing. It doesn't mean I'm going to keep you, you know, from, the, from not dying. I'm just going to keep you believing until the end. That's what he's talking about in this particular verse. Oh, sorry. Verse 11 down there says, I am coming quickly, hold fast to what you have so that no one may rob you and deprive you of your crown. This verse is a reminder to all of us to do this. Hold fast, don't give up, Keep inviting, keep talking, keep persevering. And I wonder if, um, well, let's go to verse 12. Verse 12. He who overcomes is victorious, and I will make him a pillar in the sanctuary of my God. Now, it's interesting that he says a pillar, because think about a pillar. A pillar is something that holds up buildings. But when these earthquakes hit, those pillars were shaken and destroyed. And Jesus uses this to this church and says, I will make him a pillar if you just keep on, keep, keep, keep holding fast, don't give up, keep persevering. He said, I'm going to make you a pillar in the sanctuary of God. He goes on to say, he shall never be put out of it or go out of it. 
I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which descends from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. He's trying to tell these people, your salvation is secure. You will never be taken out of my family. You're never going to go out of my family. You're part of the sanctuary of God. I'm writing my name on you is basically what he's saying. The bottom line to this church is this. You guys are doing awesome. Keep it up. Good job. Keep enduring. Keep persevering. And if you are here today and you feel very, very discouraged in your Christian life and you're like, you know what? No one wants to hear about Jesus and everyone thinks I'm crazy and I'm just tired of it all. I want this little church to encourage you. Keep going and never, ever give up. I have a friend of mine who gets very discouraged when she hears messages on marriage because her husband's not a believer. And she said, you know, Lisa, she says, it's so hard to hear this and it feels very discouraging. I've stayed in this marriage for so many years and I feel so discouraged. And this is what I say. This Church of Philadelphia, this lesson today is for you. It's for all the Christians who live with non, non-believing spouses. It's for all the Christians who live with a non-believing children or, or, or bosses. You feel like you're this island all by yourself. And today I want to just say, good job. Please don't ever, ever give up. Jesus ends his letter by saying, the eternity is your reward. I want you to walk away knowing this. Nothing you are doing for him ever goes unnoticed. The last verse is, I think I missed it. There you go. He who can hear, let him hear to to listen to and heed what the Spirit says to 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 the churches. Good job to those of you. Here's what I want to end with. Eternity is what matters. And the whole point to this letter today is look within yourself, find out what it means to be holy, and then do it. And then persevere. Because you and I are promised a grand eternity if we continue on in our faith. Lord, thank you for this lesson of this Church of Philadelphia. God, thank you that there are people in this room and watching us that love you with all their hearts and they are devoted to you and devoted to to following you and nothing is ever going to sway them. And for those that are feeling discouraged today, I pray you will stop them in their tracks and say, wait a minute, I can't do that. I can't walk away. Where would I go? God, help us to know that that we want to be like this church. Help us to look within ourselves. What can we do to live a holy life, to be a lighthouse to those around us? God, bless those here that have little to give, that God bless their ministries, their lives, their homes, so that they can shine for you and more people will come to know you because of them. In Jesus' name, amen.